Hi everyone, I'm Jack Thramling, Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on Saints and Strangers by Angela Carter. Carter is one of my absolute favorite short story writers. She had such a unique sensibility, this deep vein of irony that just slices through her stories. And she fused mythology, classical literature, fairy tales, history into these beautiful creations that, that are always from this different perspective. Um, and, and that perspective is, I think, what she's justifiably very famous for. Uh, and it's it's different from what Borges accomplishes in his short stories, where he's uh, uh, taking stylistic choices and, and really asking questions that perhaps can't be answered. Carter's doing something a little different with her stories that sort of upend what we think of as traditional short stories. And she doesn't do it in the way that Borges or someone like Donald Bartlemy did it. Uh, she does it by shifting the perspective of what we know about this story. And um, it, it's sort of like going to a different corner of the room, allowing the exact same events to happen, but from that corner, we see a whole other world. And that's really what Carter's doing in these stories. Saints and Strangers is a little bit different from The Bloody Chamber. The Bloody Chamber, an earlier collection of stories, is just marvelous. And there are these, these retellings of fairy tales, making explicit what was you know within the fairy tale implicit or edited out by certain fairy tale collectors. Here we have stories that are more based in uh, historical persons or personages, not all of them. We get a Peter and the Wolf and we get one about the Midsummer Night's Dream from Shakespeare, but most of these are based on historical people. And so for example, we get the Fall River Axe Murders, which is going to postulate one rationale for why Lizzie Borden might have taken the hatchet, not an axe in this story, to her father and stepmother. And the way that Carter just begins that story has such a unique voice. Early in the morning of the 4th of August, 1892, in the city of Fall River, Massachusetts, period. Hot, hot, hot. Even though it is early in the morning, well before the factory whistle issues its peremptory summons from the dark satanic mills to which the city owes its present preeminence in the cotton trade, the white furious sun already shimmers and quivers high in the still air. Nobody could call the New England summer a lovable thing. The inhabitants of New England have never made friends with it. More than the heat, it is the humidity that makes it scarcely tolerable. The weather clings like a low fever you cannot shake off. And so right in there, we have this, um, we have this first sentence that almost seems to be like the setting for a stage play. And then the second sentence that hot, hot, hot. And right after that, we get a reference to the dark satanic mills, a la William Blake and the sort of hymn Jerusalem. Uh, so there, there's so much packed in right there at the beginning to dump us into the story. And what unfolds is this strange experience about Lizzie Borden's family. Who were these people? What's going on on this day that sort of ticks through the morning until there are, are murders, again, with a hatchet? Uh, and, and as a story, it ends up uh, feeling a little similar to the decapitated chicken from Horacio Quiroga, the Uruguayan uh, master of you know, horror fiction. But that, that Carter sensibility is present there. Or again, in uh, the cabinet of Edgar Allan Poe. Imagine Poe in the Republic, when he possesses none of its virtues, no Spartan he. Each time he tilts the jug to greet the austere morning, his sober friends reluctantly concur. No man is safe who drinks before breakfast. Where is the black star of melancholy? Elsewhere, not here. Here it is always morning. Stern, democratic light scrubs apparitions off the streets down which his dangerous feet must go. Perhaps, perhaps the black star of melancholy was hiding in the dark at the bottom of the jug all the time. It might be the whole thing is a little secret between the jug and himself. He turns back to go and look and the pitiless light of common day hits him full in the face like a blow from the eye of God. Struck he reels, where can he hide? Where there are no shadows. They split the Republic in two. They halved the apple of knowledge. White light strikes the top half and leaves the rest in shadow. Up here, up north in the leveling latitudes, a man must make his own penumbra if he wants concealment because the massive heroic light of the Republic admits of no ambiguities. Either you are a saint or a stranger. He is a stranger here, a gentleman up from Virginia, somewhat down on his luck. And alas, he may not invoke the Prince of Darkness, always a perfect gentleman, in his cause, since of the absolute night, which is the antithesis to these days of rectitude, there is no aristocracy. Poe staggers under the weight of the Declaration of Independence. People think he is drunk. He is drunk. The prince in exile lurches through the newfound land. <laughs> that, that, that opening to a story is hypnotic. There is so much going on in there. Um, there are these slight single you know phrase references to poetry from Poe uh, there are references to other writers from that era and so Carter is taking these 
you know, she, she has taken this encyclopedic knowledge of reading and of literature and history, and she then begins to pick out the little pieces and create, take pastiches and weave them all together into this new creation. And that really, I think, is uh, one of her great strengths as a short story writer. It's why I enjoy returning to her stories, because in between reading a story and rereading an Angela Carter story, I may have read something that she's referencing that I didn't pick up on the first time. And so there's a, there's a real beauty to her, her artifice. Uh, and I think that's really what she possessed as a short story writer. And so she's absolutely one of my favorites. I'll close out with a quick reference from Black Venus, which was uh, the name of this collection in, I believe, at least the UK, maybe in, in Europe or internationally. The custard apple of her stinking Eden she, this forlorn Eve, bit and was all at once transported here as in a dream. And yet she is a tabula rasa still. She never experienced her experience as experience. Life never added to the sum of her knowledge, rather subtracted from it. If you start out with nothing, they'll take even that away from you, the good book says. In a, a later sentence, she was like a piano in a country where everyone has had their hands cut off. Um, that's Carter right there, this image of this, in, this incredible creation of, that has all this potential, all this art that can come from it, this beauty, the melody, and yet no one can play it. And the, the, the Jeanne, the um, titular character of Black Venus, who will later become a, a uh, partner to Charles Baudelaire, the great French poet, and develop her own sort of mystique, um, is this individual that no one quite can ever get a handle on. Men lust after her. Uh, and, the, and Carter makes that very real in, in, a, in an almost terrifying way. Uh, but... but that Jeanne remains outside of the world that she is inhabiting, um, outside, I should say, of the societies that she is inhabiting. And so that, that creation is very interesting. But these stories are fascinating. The Peter and the Wolf story was wild. Um, the references to Midsummer Night's Dream go into all sorts of interesting directions. And for a short story uh, in a collection that was published in the 80s, um, Carter's very in, you know, interested in the ways that she wants to explore the character Herm um, and the character Puck and having her be this non-binary character and even using like sort of uh, uh, presaging the way that we will in 2022 and in the 21st century, ex um, you know, begin to shift our use of pronouns in language and using sort of S with a, um, a hyphen H-E to describe her. So it's fascinating the way that Carter is, is just drawing on so many different ideas. And that's why I, I continue to read and reread and love her stories. And she's a writer that I must praise my wife for introducing me to. Um, but I'll add a couple of, there are very few writers who I think are, are on her level, but writers who approach some of those ideas. I would say A.S. Byatt is one of the few who draws on just so many different concepts and, and themes and philosophies and traditions within literature and history. And then weaves them together. I think Hyatt is one of the few writers who, who does that um, at, any, at a level that anywhere approaches what Carter's doing. I'll add Philip Pullman. I think his deep love of fairy tales, his deep love of uh, fantasy um, has, has, has allowed him to create some really interesting books. Um, Zora Neale Hurston was unique in that she was drawing on sort of cultural ethnographies and, and, and um, anthropology to, to create some of her uh, stories in a very effective way. And she was often writing that more as sort of a collection of folklore, uh, but it influences her stories, I think, as well. Um, and then I would say some of the sensibilities, that concept of like the piano in a country where everyone has had their hands cut off, that's the type of sensibility we find in a short story by someone like Flannery O'Connor. And again, I think O'Connor was someone who wanted to make more explicit what was implicit in so many of the uh, traditions and, and, and sort of um, folk narratives within the Southern Gothic tradition. So let me know what your favorite stories are from Angela Carter. Um, I really love her work. So thanks everyone.